All right, so get this, picture this, right? It's 1978, sunny afternoon, a seemingly ordinary day at Westall High School in Melbourne. Suddenly, hundreds of students and teachers see it, a silver saucer-shaped object just hovering in broad daylight. And we're not talking about a quick glimpse here. Yeah. This thing hangs in the sky for several minutes. You sent us a whole bunch of articles about this, the Westall UFO incident, and I gotta say, it's one of the most compelling UFO sightings I've ever heard of, really. Yeah, you know what's really interesting about Westall to me? It's not just some blurry photo or you know one person who saw something. You've got a massive group of people all saying they saw something truly unusual. It becomes this like case study and the whole idea of eyewitness accounts, but also how that gets all tangled up with you know official silence, media frenzy, and then this mystery that just won't go away. And it's that, you said it, that official silence that really gets me going, you know? Yeah, for sure. We have these really detailed accounts from people who are there, some witnesses saying the object, whatever it was, was emitting a bright light. Others describing it as being like the size of a car. Some even said it landed in a field nearby. Yet the initial response from the Australian Department of Defense was basically like, nope, we didn't see anything, nothing to see here. Which... Knowing your thing for government cover-ups has got to be one of the most frustrating things imaginable. The least satisfying answer. Right. And it gets even more interesting. Hold on. So later on, you know, some documents were dug up through those Freedom of Information Act requests. And what do they show? There was government interest in this thing. Some witnesses even say they were told to keep quiet about what they saw. Okay, so now you're just begging for the conspiracy theories to go wild. True, of course. <laughs> but before we get lost down that rabbit hole, I do want to go back to those eyewitness accounts for a second. We're talking hundreds of people seeing this thing. Are there stories? Like, are they the same? How consistent are we talking here? See, that's where it gets uh, a little tricky. They mostly agree that something was there. It's when you get into the specifics, right? The exact shape of it, how big it was, how it was moving. That's where you get some differences from person to person. Right, right. But that's not actually that strange. When you think about how eyewitness accounts work, right? Yeah. Our memories, they're not perfect. They change over time. You get stress, excitement. Even the way someone asks you about it later can change things. So you're saying it's not necessarily that people are, you know, making stuff up. It's more like... Their memories are playing a giant game of telephone. Each time they tell the story, it changes a bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's why when you look at these accounts, you need that balance, right? You need that critical thinking. Mm -hmm. but you got to be open-minded, too. We're talking about an event where people saw something truly strange, something they couldn't explain. It's like you're trying to put together this puzzle, but the pieces keep changing shape as you go. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we've got all these eyewitness accounts. We've got this air of mystery from the government. I mean, where do we even begin to try and explain what happened at Westall? Like, I imagine the theories we're going to get into range from, you know, the totally normal to the, uh, <laughs> let's just say, out there. You're right on the money. Yeah. Let's kick things off with a popular one, right? The whole secret military project idea. Mm. Governments, they do their fair share of classified stuff. Sometimes that involves aircraft that look, well, a little unusual. Sure. And knowing what we know now that the government was kind of sort of interested in Westall, it's tempting to draw a line between those two things. Especially with your interest in all things government secrecy, you jump on that. But the articles you sent, they actually go a little deeper than just saying maybe it was a secret plane, you know? Yeah. They actually look into whether there was any unusual military activity happening back then in that area, or if there were any other times when a test flight was mistaken for something. Well, you know. See, that's the sign of a good deep dive. Am I right? You don't just scratch the surface. You really got to get in there and see if there's anything to it. Yeah. And... In this case, while the stuff we've got doesn't give us a neat little answer, it does make you wonder if maybe, just maybe, we're talking about some experimental tech that people mistook for something a little more, let's say, extraterrestrial. Like that saying, right? The simplest explanation is usually the right one, but what if it isn't? What if the truth really I I is <laughs> stranger than fiction? Speaking of, uh, talking about UFOs, so we got to bring it up, weather balloons classic. No. Yes, the old faithful of ufology, right? <laughs> Always there to take the fall. No, it's true. Weather balloons, they can look a little funky from far away, especially if the light's hitting them just right. Right. But you've got to remember, we're talking about a lot of people at Westall who saw this thing. Yeah. It's a tough sell with that many witnesses. I mean, were people back then just like totally clueless about what a weather balloon looked like? I can see one or two people maybe getting it mixed up, but hundreds? Come on. That's the thing. And while those articles you sent, 
They do mention the weather balloon theory. They also point out how unlikely it is that this many people would all make the same mistake, especially with the way people describe this thing moving. Okay, so we've got our secret government projects. We've got our weather balloons having a bad day. It feels like we're slowly but surely heading towards the theory that everyone's secretly hoping for, aliens. Come on, what's the source material say about that one? Well, I wouldn't say the articles are like, Jumping up and down, endorsing the alien theory, <laughs> which I appreciate. Right? right. They lay out the facts, they show you what they've got, and then they let you come to your own conclusions. So no, like, smoking ray guns or detailed drawings of what the aliens looked like? Not this time. Yeah. But they do say that the idea of life beyond Earth, it's a powerful one. It's something that people are drawn to, you know? And the Westall thing, with the whole classic saucer-shaped description... It definitely fits that bill. It's like straight out of those old sci-fi movies, right? <laughs> totally. But before we go too far down that road, there's one more theory we need to talk about, and this one gets into, well, the human mind. Mass hysteria. <sighs> Mass hysteria, right. The idea that a bunch of people can like experience the same thing, the same symptoms, often because they think there's some kind of threat. It's wild. So are we saying that all these students, these teachers at Westall, they all just imagine they saw a UFO like it was all in their heads? Well, not exactly. It's it's a little more complicated than that. This whole mass hysteria thing, sometimes they call it mass psychogenic illness. It doesn't mean people are just making stuff up, right? right. They are experiencing something real, actual symptoms. But where it comes from is their mind, not like a virus or anything. Think of it like uh, like dominoes, one thing knocks into the next. You've got stress, people feeding off each other's energy. Maybe they were already a little anxious about something, and boom, you get the shared experience, even if what got it all started wasn't what they thought it was. So there could have been something there, something that got the ball rolling, even something small that people might not have even noticed at first, and then it just becomes this huge event. Exactly. The problem is trying to prove if mass hysteria explains Westall, well, it's tough. This was decades ago. We'd need to know way more about the people who were there, what their lives were like, and even then, it's like trying to put together a puzzle when you're missing half the pieces. Like trying to remember a dream. You remember how it made you feel, but the details are fuzzy? Yeah, something like that. Okay, so we've got all these theories, some more believable than others, but let's step back for a second. This wasn't just like some local thing that people forgot about. This Westall incident, I mean, it blew up. It was all over Australia. Big time. It wasn't just a couple of kids telling tall tales, right? You had teachers, parents, people who lived in the area all saying they saw this thing. No wonder it was all over the news. And you know, I love a good story about how the media shapes things. So tell me what they make of it all. Did they jump on the whole UFO thing or were they more, you know, skeptical? You know, it's funny when you look at how they covered it back then, you see the same kind of reactions you get today. You know, some of them, they went full on sensational. Big headlines about UFOs, alien encounters, the whole nine yards. There's a good alien story always sells, am I right? Oh, you know it. Yeah. But then there were others, more careful ones. They focused on what those witnesses said, how nobody really knew what to make of it, laid out the different theories without really saying which one they believed. Oh. It was it was a microcosm of what you see today. Everything from the diehards who believe to the skeptics who, well... They need to see it to believe it. A good mix of, like, excitement and then, all right, let's think about this for a second. Sounds like the perfect ingredients for a mystery that never gets old. But even beyond all the media hype, this whole thing, it felt like it was about something bigger, don't you think? 100%. Yeah. Westall became this, this focal point for people who wanted answers. Right. They wanted to know why the government wasn't doing more to figure out what happened if they were hiding something. It wasn't even just about a possible UFO anymore, you know? Mm. It was about trust, who's really in charge, and who gets to decide what story gets told. And those questions, man, those are just as important now as they were way back then. <laughs> Makes you wonder, right? Like, if this happened today, smartphones everywhere, social media blowing up, would we be any closer to figuring out what happened at Westall? Or would we just have more noise, more opinions, you know? Million-dollar question. <laughs> more information? Does that mean more clarity or just more to get lost in? It's mm -hmm. like the story of our times, right? Isn't it, though? So as we wrap up our little deep dive into Westall and the whole UFO thing, here's what I hope you take away from it. Westall shows us that some things, even with all those people who saw it, some things just stay mysteries, and that's okay. It should make us ask questions, be curious, and be okay with saying, I don't know, you know? Maybe the real discovery isn't about getting all the answers, but about exploring the unknown.